as I'll, I'll whip through all this stuff, is um, the United Nations Conventions on the Rights of People with Disabilities came in in 2006. It was actually the fastest moving UN convention that's ever been um, negotiated and ratified. They started talking about it in 2001. By 2006 they had the convention all ready to go and countries started signing on to it. So um, what, what the UN Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities does is it tries to present um, disability access as a human rights issue. So people with disabilities have a human right to access the whole community as people without disabilities do. So what they said, um, people with disabilities have the right to live independently, participate fully in all aspects of social life. <coughs> and um, so people who sign on to the convention, countries have to take um, the appropriate measures to ensure people with disabilities has, have access on an equal basis to people without disabilities to um, all sorts of environments. There, there are 50 articles, so some of the environments are the the physical environment, to transport, to health, um, education, um, and information and communication technologies is also big in the UN Convention, um, as it is in, in our, all of our social lives now. So the UN Convention recognises that people with disabilities have a right to access information and communications in the same way they have a right to access roads, transport, buildings, and school, medical facilities, participate in the workforce, so information and communication is being recognised as, in, as an important as access to things like health and education. So the UN defines communication as, um, so languages, displays, of text, braille, or tactile communication, large print, accessible multimedia, as well as written, audio, play language, human reader and augmentative and alternative modes and means of communication including accessible information and communication technology. So I think television should fit into that. So I see the UN as saying people with disabilities have a right to access and participate and watch television <coughs> just like everyone else does. So um, how can we make TV more accessible to people with disabilities? There are a number of ways. So this is a list of different accessibility features that some are available on TV and some sort of in a blue sky hypothetical environment could be available through digitisation of television. So, so audio description is um, the track of narration which des describes what's happening on the screen usually appears in between bits of dialogue, and this is an access feature for people who are blind or vision impaired. Um, captions, I'm sure you've all seen captions or subtitles at some point in your um, TV viewing career by now. So this is the, um, the presentation of the audio on television um, as text on the screen. Lip reading avatars, as far as I know, this is not really widespread, but the technology is there and different people are developing with 3D avatars, so to have an animated talking head in the bottom of the of the um, talking parts for lip readers and signing avatars where we've got hands down the bottom of the screen, tr translating what's happening on the screen into sign language, spoken subtitles, so that's where the subtitles can be read aloud of benefit people with vision impairment but also um, people learning another language. Um, clean audio, this is something that people are really getting excited about in my, um, in my research and that is because we have an ageing population. So clean audio is where you can, um, so background audio or music is sort of muted and you just hear the dialogue or, or the main information on the television screen. So. People as, as they age want this and also people who are watching TV late at night don't want to wake up the rest of the family but still want to be able to hear the dialogue, uh, getting excited about clean audio. So um, something that I found in, in my research and in the literature is that people with hearing impairments are heavy television consumers. And I really like this, this quote from a blogger about how television has changed in Australia over the last 30 years. He's talking about how 
you know, 30 years ago there was there was virtually no captioning in this country. And then as as things came out on video, it would take many years for the video to actually be captioned. But then um, now with DVD, things are captioned at the top point that the DVD is released. Generally, there are some exceptions to that. Um, and then with Net Netflix, which I'll also talk about throughout this talk, um, Netflix should have 100% content captioned as a result of Americans with Disabilities <coughs> Discrimination complaint against them. And so Netflix in Australia, we have pretty much all the captioning here. So we say we get, we're getting thousands of movies. Um, we've come a long way, um, but there's, there's still a bit to go, and I'll talk about in a minute. And I really like this uh, picture of an example of what captioning is. Someone talking on the phone, are you listening to me? So people who cannot hear can have access to this information. So here's my social inclusion part. Why is, um, why is television important to people with disabilities? And what we found is um, people with disabilities often talk about the social side of TV as why it's important. Um, Start with the, the quote from Lauren Hen Henley from Blind Citizens Australia, and she says, you know, TV is really important to her sense of social inclusion. It's not just about wanting to keep up to date with days of our lives. Um, so, like the first rest of her family and friends, she wants a choice about what she watches, have the ability to be informed about what's going on in the world. And Lauren actually lost her sight, so she can reflect on what life was like when she was able to watch TV. And, and after, and she said she lost social inclusion when she lost the ability to watch television and then talk about it <coughs> with um, her family and friends. And the bottom two quotes are from people who I've interviewed as part of my research. Um, so what they're saying is significance of audio description is about the social aspect of TV rather than television itself. Um, and the second quote was from a man who was talking about, you know, he got to go home and watch TV with his family and his kids. And as part of his story, he was talking to me about how, you know, his kids were getting annoyed with him, you know, watching TV. He wanted to watch something that wanted to watch something else. And that was an experience he hadn't had before. So that was, you know, really positive form of social inclusion for him. And just in case you are not familiar with what audio description is, I'm going to show you a clip from Daredevil on Netflix. <coughs> when, when we practice this before the audio... The passenger doors flung open in his fist, face twisted with rage, gangs Anatoly from the car and flings him down. The Russian screams to his feet and punches at Fisk, who doesn't budge. His hands are like hands pounding at Anatoly's head. He yanks him up by the neck and throws him down, the city skyline in the background. <coughs> Anatoly brings out a blade. He slashes Fisk across his coat sheet, revealing not skin, but a fibrous material, body armor. Fisk pins him to the side of the SUV and breaks his arm. You embarrassed me. Embarrassed me in front of her. Fisk headbutts Anatoly again and again. Wesley sits in the car, hands folded, staring forward. Anatoly, on the ground, crawls toward the safety of the SUV, Fisk walking behind him. He looks up at Wesley, pleading. Wesley gives him a blank glance. Anatoly raises himself into the car as Fisk slugs him again. He lifts Anatoly and lays his head against the door frame. Then repeatedly slams the door on the man's head. Wesley stares, unaffected. Fisk's teeth are gritting with fear as he relentlessly swings the door. Wesley calmly exits on the other side, but with a suit jacket. Finally, Anatoly's head is torn off. Seen from beneath the car, a splash of blood and brains on the asphalt. Fisk stares at the blood splattered reflection in the car window. His eyes flash. 
All right, so that's um, <coughs> audio description. Another thing that's interesting about captions and audio description is that while people are really familiar with what captioning is, they're not lots and lots of people who have never heard of audio description before. And um, they would develop sort of around, around the same time. I don't know what's playing now. Um, but in terms of advocacy, well, deaf advocates are really concentrating on access to television as a, um, a human right and a social right. One activist instead, we're concentrating on access to the workforce. Which is an important right. Um, but with uh, video on demand coming in, we're seeing um, blind activists coming together and advocating for access to television in a way that we haven't seen before. So that's audio description. And just this, this picture here, you can see how you can turn on audio description on Netflix. It's in, it's in the language bar, which I think is really pretty cool. So it's been presented as as you know, another language and another way to access television. It's really easy to turn on down there and off. And they've got you know catalogues of audio description available shows. So uh, what about just Australia generally? Um, in terms of our accessible television here. Well, I'm going to focus on audio description for, for most of this discussion now. Um, so in 2010, this, the government started talking about this, um, and they suggested that the move to digital and online television, along with industry innovation, would result in um, more accessibility, like audio description, and a better provision of captioning. Um, the, so, um, so the government, Telstra and Google, all came together. This was around a, a, a government policy discussion paper. Um, they said, you know, accessibility should be left up to industry innovation. This is not something we need to legislate. Let's see what happens when um, people innovate. So um, 2013, a report by the European Union found that um, accessibility is actually more widely in place um, on digital online television in countries that do legislate. And um, so when we did start legislating for captions, we did see more captions becoming available and the cost of technology fell so people could afford it. And we now are in a situation where we theoretically have 100% caption content. Uh, audio description, similar story, <coughs> different story. In 2012, we had the 12 week trial on the ABC. And during that trial, we saw the same situation as what happened with captioning. So people needed particular set-top boxes to access the audio description and they were saying, well, I'm not going to buy a set-top box to access audio description if it's only going to be on for 12 weeks. So um, in 2015, um, Netflix finally came to Australia legally and it was also at this time that they introduced audio description on their original programming. So people who required audio description started watching Netflix. And then in 2016 we had the trial on ABC iView, another trial of audio description to see you know, if offering it on iView was a, was a better way to go and technology had changed anyway since 2012. And in 2017, the government has convened an audio description working group, which I'm on, and we are discussing options to bring in audio description to Australia. And one of our terms of reference is to try and look into not legislating this and look into other options. So the report is apparently going to be finished in December. I don't yet know what it's going to say. So. One of the issues back here I said was um, the, the Australian standards around the set-top boxes, they can all display captions but they can't all display audio description. 
So Australian standards are then an important part of whether accessibility is available to people with disabilities. And um, again, the um, captions, yes, audio description, no. Um, federal government commission, commissioned a survey of lots of different set-top boxes to see what, which set-top boxes could receive audio description. And what they found was there was no particular standard in terms of their set-top boxes did not whatever. You know, they displayed audio description in all kinds of different ways. So we really need to have one standard for displaying this in order to have audio description in this country, is what I think. So um, we're in a, in a situation where people are saying, yeah, we want audio description and captioning on TV, and industry government saying, well, at the point where we get competition and innovation, that is when we will have better accessibility. So I've done a study of catch-up television services, which I argue would have been affected by the introduction of video on demand, things like Netflix, Sam Presto, et cetera, um, and in terms of the display of captions on those. So I first looked into this in 2014 to see which catch-up TV services display captions and which didn't. And what I discovered was that ABC and SBS did. They displayed captions. Um, Channel 7 started displaying captions during the process of my research. At the beginning of the research they didn't, at the end they did. Um, but what I found was all, all the uh, commercial stations were saying, we're working on it, it's in the works or it's in the pipeline, but never really putting a timeline on it. So that was 2014. Then 2015 we have Netflix and all the other video on demands come in. So you think, well that's competition. Has this had an effect on the, um, on the provision of, of captions on our um, commercial freeware catch-up services? And what I found in 2016 is no, it really had no effect because, again, SBS and ABC, they offered captions. Channel 7 did, but still they weren't guaranteeing it on every single episode in a series. And still 9 and 10, no captions. So, um, just for continuity, I also looked at video <coughs> on demand. As you can see, in 2014, there was no Netflix stand or Presto. Um, and the, uh, there was captions on Quick Flicks, but only if they were provided by the studio. And what we found was they were really difficult to figure out how to access them. It wasn't a simple matter of going and seeing the closed caption turn on. Um, it was hard to understand who actually, which shows actually had captions there. And again, in, in 2016, we have the, um, after the launch of Video On Demand, Netflix has captions because of that ADA complaint I mentioned at the beginning. Um, Quick Flicks still has their few captions that were difficult to identify. Stan, they launched without captions, but then a few months later, they introduced captions quietly and didn't really publicise it to the disability community. And you know, my research team really, we really just found out by accident, you know, we'd done all this research and has captions, Stan doesn't have captions, and then they bring it in, but just with no kind of message to the people who would need to use it. Um, and difficult to figure out how to use. So Presto, which was the Foxtel video on demand that has since been folded, they did they had no captions. Foxtel Play, no captions. Easy Flicks, which so you can see in this table too, all the all the providers that went broke after Netflix came in. So and that was also an interesting aspect of the research. And audio description, are they working on that? I don't know. So in my initial survey of people with disabilities that I did in 2013. About 97% of people with vision impairment who responded to my survey, survey said they watched TV, that watching TV was difficult, and then around 72.5% said they'd really like audio description. And again, I've got another quote from someone I spoke to about why audio description was important. And what's interesting about this quote is she 
focuses on television, not just on the social aspect of television, but the difficulty of watching television. She talks about watching Power Games, a show that moved between locations and um, lots of characters, and she says she couldn't tell what was work going on on screen, um, snippets of text that she couldn't read, and she said she was watching this show and she didn't even know what country the show was set in at certain times, so she was really missing out there on the experience of television. So here we go back to Netflix. There's a lot of argument that Netflix is the answer to accessibility for people with disabilities, particularly in terms of the availability of audio description. And something we need to remember in this whole discussion is that Netflix is a service you pay for using the internet. And for a lot of people with disabilities, paying for the internet is not always something that they're able to afford. And for elderly people, with vision impairment, this is even more so the case that sometimes a decision has to be made between eating and paying for the internet. So video on demand isn't the answer for everyone who has a vision impairment, but we are getting audio description in this country via video on demand. I won't talk about Netflix complicated relationship with accessibility. I've kind of alluded to the complaints they've made against them. They've also been different ad online advocacy groups, for example, the Accessible Netflix Project, who really agitated Netflix for change in terms of their provision of audio description. So my video on demand research in 2015, I've already talked about closed captions, only being on Netflix and Stan, yes, I'm quick flips, but no one could figure out how to use it. Audio description was only available on Netflix. So video on demand, who knows if it's always the answer. Uh, we also asked, so we're asking people which on-demand services they were using and Netflix Australia was the most popular there, we think because of their um, large catalogue of caption content and being the only place in Australia that actually offered audio description. So Catch Up TV next. Not, I mean, there's not really much to say about that other than Netflix was the most popular. But here was, we're looking at how are people accessing the video on demand. And <coughs> the, um, the iPad tablet, most popular, desktop, pretty close. But what, su what surprised us, in a we're surprised but not really that surprised kind of sense, was the smartphone being as popular as it was in terms of a way to access television. And I suppose if you know you're just listening to the audio, it doesn't really matter that your phone is this small, you know, rather than watching a big TV screen. So the smartphone was pretty popular there. And the question, do you find video on demand more or less accessible? Mainly more, but not significantly more, and so sort of all around the same. And people here talking to us about why they liked. Netflix so much and it's just about the availability of captions being done in free to air TV and something coming up in these critiques as well is the um, the portals through which the so for example the ABC how you watch catch up TV on ABC that site being inaccessible was a problem and this is something the ABC has been informed about and not fixed in an ongoing capacity. And the, the fact that people can access lists of programs through the Netflix app that are audio described rather than having to search around, I'm not really sure where to find it. It's useful. Uh, Foxtel cops a lot of complaints all throughout the five years that I've been researching this. You know, people have had an issue with Foxtel and the idea that, you know, say you require captions and they're not available on Foxtel, you're paying the same amount as someone who doesn't use captions, so it is not, it's not, you're not paying for the same service in that respect. And something that Foxtel do is, you know how they advertise Game of Thrones, for example, same time as the US? They don't offer the captions on that first screen. You've got to wait the seven hours until, until they repeat before you can get the captions, which I'll talk about a bit later 
as well. So we, of course, through our video on demand research recommendations, firstly government, we recommended they needed to think about introducing legislation and working with people with disabilities. And um, so our recommendation to the video on demand service provider is, you know, recognise people with disabilities as a proportion of your audience who, you know, have families and friends that they might want to watch TV with. So, you know, we said if you can't be bothered making your content accessible for these groups, this huge group, if you think about people with disabilities make up 20% of the population, and then their families and friends who they might want to watch TV with or talk about TV with, it's huge. Yeah, we suggested higher accessibility consultants to make it happen, um, and for people with disabilities to agitate and um, not just be silent about this, get involved in advocacy efforts like the Accessible Netflix project or disability discrimination complaints. Um, so what I just want to briefly end on is um, something that I feel that has been left out of this whole discussion and that is the, um, the notion of innovation and um, creativity. So we've already seen, and this has been argued before, that um, broadcasters and video on demand providers aren't valuing people with disabilities as part of their audience members. Um, and most of the focus in this discussion is on the technical problems, so why can't we offer audio description on Australian broadcast television? The reason is because it's too complicated. Australian broadcast television is on all these different time zones, all these different channels and different regional locations, different technologies. So focusing on those, those technical problems we're not really looking at innovation around the way captions and audio description can be used by consumers. Um, so I think we all probably broadly recognise the human rights of people with disabilities to <coughs> access television, but the, this argument doesn't seem to be working as well as it should be. And so what, what I want to start looking at going into the future, maybe I can get some of your ideas here now, is the idea of creativity and innovation um, and how that can be brought into this discussion. Maybe some ideas of how these features can be used. And now I've got a, um, a little gift there from um, Twin Peaks. Who watched the Twin Peaks? Anyone in this room? No one. No one watched the Twin Peaks. Okay. Well, I'll yeah. Okay. So, um, so something that happened with the return is people were saying, "What's going on? I don't really get it." It was it was really complicated. There were lots and lots of layers. And so, when Audrey came, when Audrey's return finally happened, I think it was episode nine. Which is, nobody had any idea what was going on. And she was, the conversation when she returned, when she first appeared was around these people called Billy, Tina, Chuck and Paul and no one knew who they were. So what people did was they went and got the caption track. So looked up the transcripts to see, if, you know, see who Billy, Tina, Chuck and Paul were and try to piece together what Audrey's story actually was and if, and if Billy, Tina, Chuck and Paul actually made any difference to the ongoing story, which I don't think they did in the end. And so what people discovered was the character Billy was introduced earlier in one of the, well, I won't go into it if no one's watched it, um, but they, um, there was also a character called Bing, and so there was this big discussion about the transcript closed caption track, is was there a mistake in it? You know, was Audrey talking about Billy? She, she was talking about Billy, but the caption track earlier had talk, was talking about Bing, so people were trying to piece together this story, and they really needed reliable captions to do it, and as far as I can tell, they haven't fully figured it out, and I couldn't figure out what Audrey's story was either. So <laughs> I'm going to have to go back and watch it all again. So, um, Let's briefly look at a case for mainstreaming accessibility features like captions and audio description 
within education, um, we find that captured lectures um, improve comprehension of student, students. Students are able to go back and search lecture transcripts for keywords. Um, audio description improves literacy. Um, captures and audio descriptions together do all sorts of crazy things and really help out certain groups of students, for example, students who have intellectual disabilities. So as I was saying with Twin Peaks, um, captions offer us an opportunity for transcripts. So we can, we can go back and, and look into TV shows or if we're talking about education um, lectures. Um, there's been some research done around cooking shows and the use of captions in, in cooking shows and what this could potentially mean for sorts of software that's developed. So, so when people watch cooking shows, they want to go go off and look up the recipe later because on the cooking show itself it's not really presented in a, a recipe form is it it's it's like entertainment it's more about what happens in the kitchen rather than the recipe that people want to go back and get later so with with captions that that recipe can kind of be co cobbled together and the different parts of the show can be put together put online and people can access, but also another thing that could happen is, you know, like for example, MasterChef, they connect with Coles, don't they? Coles or Woolworths, I don't know which one. So you can connect that to, to the Coles website and then, so this is, this is the commercial aspect that people should be looking into. You know, order all the food that you need to make this recipe. And, um, as I was saying, Twin Peaks viewers were going back to the caption track to try to figure out exactly what was going on. And the discussion was, well, you know, and David Lynch really knows, but now that we know he's come out and said, well, actually, it's up to you guys to figure out what was happening. It's, you know, everyone has their own interpretation, their own story. Um, another example is Game of Thrones. Now, early in the research, I discovered people without hearing impairments were watching Game of Thrones with the captions on so they could figure out exactly what was happening with the complicated character names and locations. So that's, that's another use of Game of Thrones. Um, I also think in terms of multitasking, audio description and cat, audio description in particular is really useful here. So. People have never really paid full attention to TV, despite what you know, the criticism of TV is. You know, turning people into you know, idiots who just look at a screen. People never really just sat there and watched TV. And having audio description on allows us to multitask around television. So um, do other things. Mike always talks about vacuuming with the watching Daredevil with the audio description track on. I don't do it, but Mike does. Um, and uh, there are other uses here. So one group that people were thinking could benefit from audio description is parents of young children. So not getting a chance to sit down and watch TV, but you can still have it on and be doing all your parental things while still being able to follow what's happening. And um, for binge watchers, again, you know, having audio description on while you're driving to work is, is another suggestion that's been made. Again, not something I would probably do. Um, and also, the thing I think about audio description is it's offering so much more information about what is happening on the screen. So, you know, things you're missing, you, you can get through the audio description tracks, so different colours of... Um, of costumes, it's, if you watch audio, watch Daredevil with the audio description track on, you really do get a lot more information and it ties together in a way you, you might have missed out on certain things. Um, so captions, people use them already in um, gyms, bars, planes, libraries, instead of having sound on and what we're seeing a lot more of now is on Facebook and for example, I, I opened up news.com.au the other day and an ad for a TV show that was airing last night came on but the sound didn't start, it just had the captions. So
So now it's sort of a whole industry has been created about this, around this automatic play feature on, capture, on Facebook where videos just started playing and people were sort of, oh my god. So they turn off the um, they turn off the, the sound so it doesn't disrupt people in certain situations. So now we're seeing a lot more of captioning on online videos. And I've um, talked to people who create these captions and they say they are slightly different to the type of caption that people who are deaf or hearing impaired do need. But we are seeing, I guess, a new industry around and availability around <coughs> Captionings and a normalisation of this feature that it's on all of our Facebook. We see it, they just start. Um, so, which leads us to the idea of personalising television, which is something that we're all doing, and people could come up with any sorts of uses for captions and audio description that I haven't thought of yet. Um, another show that people are really getting quite excited about in terms of audio description is Sense8, which has a lot of good cuts, different characters, people don't actually really know what's going on. Um, so I've got two, uh, two titles from these articles here about audio description and Sense8. So people are saying the descriptive narrator is the best part of Sense8, um, and Netflix audio descriptions make Sense8 easier to follow. So in this way, people who are not visually impaired are using sensation, using audio description just to make sense of a popular TV show. I, um, as part of my work on the audio description working group, Netflix came and gave us a presentation uh, by phone. <laughs> so, and they really talked a lot about this sensate and how people are using audio description to watch sensate. And for them, they're trying, they were, shaping it as you know they've got audio description which is a really important consumer experience and they're all about making sure their audiences are happy and they'll do whatever they need to do for them so in that way audio description I guess was completely turned around from being something for a, a small group as something for con to make consumers happy for example people watching Sensei who have no idea what's happening now they can figure it out um, so just to wrap things up, I guess people think, you know, oh, do blind people really watch TV? And the answer is yes, they do. And research going back to the 60s shows that blind people do watch TV at least once a day. And through all the, the audio description trials with the ABC broadcast and iView, we've got feedback through that that people with vision impairment are watching TV and they appreciate and actually find it a better experience to watch TV using audio description. Um, so, of course, the, these groups have a human right to access television, which will allow them participation in society. And, and so, some of the feedback from the trials was that people didn't really realise how much they were missing out on by not being able to watch television and how much we actually talk about TV in our day-to-day -day lives as a way to connect with people. So, um, people with disabilities make up an important part of the audience and once you include their family and friends, that audience is really massive. Um, as, as I'm saying, TV, important for social inclusion, something to talk about. Um, so, when we include alternative formats like captions and audio description, sort of as a mainstream feature, something that you can turn on that's there as part of the television experience. The, um, what I'm calling the default user position changes. So when we think about television now, it's an audio visual medium. We probably think of the default user as someone with vision and hearing. But when we have these other features, that user position can, um, can change. And, um, could this result, my question is, could this result in more social inclusion for people with disabilities and better access to television? And something to think about is convenience for non-disabled non people in this argument and using that as a way to achieve the goal of better social inclusion and access to television for people with disabilities. And something I forgot to say, this is the end of my talk, electric toothbrushes were developed for people with disabilities. Who has an electric toothbrush in this room? 
Thank you. Thank you.